You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 186, Fern and Audrey, Discovering Mercy. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland. And he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, it's nice to be in the same room with you and <laughs> Fern and Audrey in Rhode Island of all the places. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you were saying the other day that you never thought you'd see Rhode Island. So what do you think? I, well, I, yeah, I never thought I would ever be in Rhode Island. And here I am. And... And you get to see fall. Yes, I actually get to see color on the trees, and it was pretty cold where we ate Yeah, you had a good time then. (laughs) Can you tell everybody what we did last night for dinner? Oh, yeah. Uh, On the, we we took a little road trip uh, to get here, and the four of us had dinner at George's of Galilee. And for those of you uh, who have read my fiction, uh, The Portent in particular, which is the sequel to The Facade. That is the restaurant where uh, Brian and the Colonel sort of have their meeting of the minds that the the second book pivots on. So we thought, hey, it's on the way. Why not go to George's for dinner? <laughs> the Colonel was not there. No, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> but the but the lobster and clam chowder was. Yeah, and it was pretty good. Yeah, it was good stuff. Although you made me crack. Yeah. Some lobster claw for you because you didn't want to put in the work. That's right. But. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you know, what can I say? That, that, that's why I, I rarely order that kind of thing. No, I hear you. It's not enough payoff. You and me both. <laughs> well, we're glad that, uh, not only that we could make the trip, you know, and have some, uh, have some face time and spend some time together with Fern and Audrey, but, uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to talk to them again and both give something of an update because they have lots of new things uh, to say, things that are going on, things that have developed for them, and also uh, to to really sort of get into some specifics. Part of the reason we're together uh, at this point was, again, I, I spend, I think, how, how long has it been? Three days. Yeah, it was three days, but we've been doing that those three days for like, yeah, since seven 2010, years, yeah. seven years. And uh, we want to talk about a few of the things, uh, you know, just sort of extract a few things that were discussed um, in our group this time and share them with listeners. So we thought this would be a good time to do that. So let's just jump in. Uh, You guys have a new website and more importantly, a new nonprofit entity. So you've sort of gone to the next level and making a transition. So let's open with that. Tell us about that. Um, Yes, we have. Um, Discovering Mercy is our nonprofit that we work out of. We currently are waiting for a tax exempt status. That is um, six months um, Mm -hmm. that we're waiting for that. So it should be any day now. Mm -hmm. And we decided to, um, through the encouragement of, you know, folks like you, Mike, and others that said, you know, you really need to move into a nonprofit. And so we have. And in that transition, we did do a website not to expose anything of what really we do. But when folks come to see us, they always ask us, well, you know, where are we coming to? What does it look like? And so we came up with a website that kind of shows where they'll be staying, about the Mm -hmm. heart of of the ministry, what we're doing with the ministry, what it will look like for, for them so they're not totally caught off guard. So the website really is for that point. It does. I mean, we took a look at it uh, and, you know, kudos to Joe uh, and his wife uh, for putting that together. Uh, Joe and Siobhan uh, did did the work that uh, went into the website. And, uh, you know, it's it's a beautiful site and it does give some information, uh, just a little bit. But, mm-hmm. yeah, you're right. It's it's sort of a basic, uh, you know, visual orientation gives a little bit of the details about the accommodations and whatnot so yeah audrey spent hours working uh on a format and a and a visual presentation so that the survivor the person coming to see us would be very comfortable in what they saw and she has spent a lot of time helping even with um 
creating the atmosphere at the office and the home where they'll stay for safety and um, so they can begin their journey. Audrey, do you want to add to that? Any th- any specific thinking that went into that? Um, it was it was surrounded by the touching the heart of a survivor so that they knew what discovering mercy's heart is because fern and i really want them to know that they're coming to a place that they'll be loved and not judged and that what they've always wanted their heart would be known seen and loved one of the reasons why we even chose the name discovery mercy was because um we took the the beginning letters in mercy and and we capitalized it discovering me in mercy because one of the things in trauma-based mind control um, the first thing that we help them do is to normalize the dissociation so that they're not afraid of themselves and so the discovering me in the midst of god's mercy was really important to us and that's why we chose that name and the whole um, heart behind the nonprofit, the name, the place they stay, the website, um, really was for the heart to, of the survivor. Right. Even in the logo, the logo has a heart that's half hidden. And that's for survivors. They, they know their heart's there. They just can't find it all. And that's what we want them to do is find their heart. So the site is discoveringmercy.org. Yeah, dot O-R-G. Um, for those who uh, you know might not have heard the previous episodes, or maybe they did, uh, and you know without the necessity of going back uh, through you know previous discussions we've had, um, why don't we just for those people, and again for the sake of, re- of review. Uh, just sort of overview what it is uh, that you do, you know, defining you know, trauma-based mind control, dissociation, some of the terminology that gets um, tossed around. I don't know if we want to go into distinguishing any of that from sort of pop cultural uh, portrayals of it, because recently there have been a couple and people listening to this might hear the conversation today and think, oh, that's like the movie Split or, oh, that's like Stranger Things. You know, so if, if you want to make some distinctions there, we can. Otherwise, I think some definitions to start off would be good or, you know, just trying to describe, you know, what it is that you're doing and what do we mean by survivor? Um, I guess to start with would be what is dissociation? And that is a disconnection between a person's thoughts, memories, feelings, actions, or sense of who he or she is. This is a normal process for everyone. Everyone experiences dissociation, like mild common dissociation includes daydreaming or highway hypnosis, or getting lost in a book or a movie. Um, That's what everyone has. And in a survivor's case, it's much more organized and um, complex than just daydreaming on the highway. Mm So trauma-based mind control is we are identifying a uh, person or uh, started as a child that they have lived through a lot of trauma and the trauma was purposefully perpetrated so that that child could be controlled through um, behavior. They can be conditioned to respond and obey to the perpetrator. And that's what we're calling trauma-based mind control. I think that... Um, so it's like an intentional wiring of, it certainly is of thought or behavior, all those sorts yes. of things. There, There is thought and intention behind that. And as we've discussed before, that intentional um, perpetration really came out of the 50s. And we do have some clients that would probably be have been earlier than that. So I don't want to just stop at 50s. But it is the researchers of the educators, psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, it's not, it's not just backyard Satanism. It's, it's much more organized. It's, it is, it is for research purposes. Yeah. And, and again, for some listeners that, that will strike a chord with them. Research that was, again, maybe not, maybe to say begun uh, in the 50s might, again, be a bit anachronistic, but it usually gets associated with uh, something like MK Ultra, which wasn't just one program. It was dozens, maybe even you know, hundreds of programs. And 
that was exposed in the 70s through the church hearings, uh, you know, in, in Congress. And most of the, the records of that were destroyed, but we know about it because there were, you know, a number of boxes that, that didn't make it to destruction. And that research, though, was, was passed on. You had, um, again, academics, you had uh, practitioners in the fields of psychiatry and, and psychology, and they had graduate students. And they, the graduate students were interested in this area of research. And by this time, those graduate students have now had graduate students. And so, you know, the, the, the research continues on whether, uh, and I think, you know, we'd all agree that it, it's probable that you know, some sort of, uh, there's still some sort of, you know, government use of this kind of thing. Uh, for instance, Annie Jacobson in her book uh, on phenomena uh, gets into it a little bit. You know, she mentions this this part of um, the whole uh, history of the, the U.S. government's in, involvement in what, again, would broadly be termed psychic phenomena. But um, since this is dealing with the mind, you know, she, she drifted over there a little bit. But, you know, uh, there's some sort of, you know, official and covert, you know, use of this, like there has been since the fifties, but you have a lot of people who in these fields who are just interested in, you know, this area and, and everything associated with it. And so it, it never really went away. It just sort of, it actually multiplied and, and kind of spun out of control. I think you could even say, because it's not sort of governed by one agency or, you know, one funding source, you know, that sort of thing. So you you're, you guys are, are dealing with, people that um, have been victimized and associated with that sort of stuff. And so that I like your phrase, this isn't backyard Satanism. Uh, this is done by a lot of really smart people who have resources and a history of research, which means a history of techniques, you know, behind this. Now, we should say uh, on the heels of that, one of the things I think that makes, at least in, in my exposure to this area, uh, as as far as a, um, a sort of Christian ministry that that touches this, and there are, there's not a lot of that to begin with, but one of the things that um, makes you different is that you actually spend a considerable amount of time in the academic research. You know, the journal literature. You're in contact with professors and experts that, again, for lack of a better way of saying it, this is their bread and butter academically. So you pay a lot of attention to uh, real peer-reviewed research, and that, yeah, and you use that. You don't shun it. Oh well, that's not like a Bible verse, you know. That you you actually use, you know, the research in, and it helps you in the way you approach um, survivors and the way that you um, you work with them. So can you describe that a little bit? You know, your your relationship to the research. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. It really is a, a big um, jump off point from just doing simple prayer ministry. While Audrey and I sport no mental health credentials at all, um, it, it was really important for me as I got into working with survivors that I noticed that the routine prayer ministry approach just didn't help. It, it wasn't, you're working with someone who the conditioning to this child, the child, first of all, did not have the opportunity to grow and develop in safety, in connection, in family, in attunement, in relationship at all. So there's this huge disconnect just from another human being. And so to bring them into a prayer ministry setting and, and go into a relational thing, let's get to the memories and let Jesus come in and speak, there was no foundation for relationship at all like that. However, a huge percentage, 98% of the people that come to see us are born again. They love Jesus very much. and um, But all of the trauma, the folks in the trauma inside of the person didn't know how to do relationship. So that sent us into Daniel Siegel's work on interpersonal neurobiology. He's the father of that. That's saying basically... Every child in development synchronizes with the nervous system of the, the, the mom and the dad. And in that synchronization of nervous system, that child is learning um, how to do life. The brain is developing in a certain way. And so we noticed that that 
attachment, the attunement needed to develop a healthy child was purely absent. So Daniel Siegel's work of interpersonal neurobiology, Bonnie Badenoch takes a lot of the interpersonal neurobiology, some more um, attachment theory, and she writes a book to therapists, and it's called The Brain Savvy Therapist or The Brain Wise Therapist. She's got a workbook with it too. And she is go- explaining to the therapists who have been trained typically to say, just integrate these, you know, just the child's regress, get them integrated. Bonnie's saying something totally different with the research of Dan Signal, Pat Ogden, Janina Fisher, and she's giving it to the therapist and saying, you know, these little kids that grew up in trauma, developed in trauma, really think differently in their world. They can't just come alongside and do a worldview from a normal development. So we we noticed that this was happening to our folks in front of us. And we went in and the attachment theory um, research and the body somatic theory research. And it was interesting how I would say that the Lord showed us that this is what we needed to do. And we just started doing this at about seven, eight years ago. And when we found these current research books, these books that came out of research, Bonnie Badenox, Janina Fisher has a great book, Healing the Fragmented Cells of Trauma Survivors. Um, it's not totally exactly what we do, but there is a lot of strong uh, stepping stones of, that will help people have a paradigm shift to walk into helping a survivor rather than the old historic model of going through the memory, stirring up the darkness, and having Jesus come in and speak truth. So we have seen huge results with a survivor who has been taught not to think when they understand what the neurobiological responses in their brain, because these folks have been taught to understand what their brain's doing. They've been programmed into certain wave states, you know, like delta, theta, alpha, beta. They've been they've been taught that little child would have been conditioned to stay in a beta wavelength in her mind. So they get when we're talking about the brain development and that there's someone stuck in limbic, which is the back of their their uh, brain. They they understand it. I know that prayer ministers or people hearing us might think, oh, my gosh, I've got to be a PhD to help a survivor. But you really don't. Neither Audrey and I are. But the the person sitting in front of you that has been hurt, they get this. Yeah, and they may not have had words that I was in Delta wave, brainwave, but they understand that what they're in right now presenting to us feels like this. And oh my word, that's the words for it. Mm -hmm. And so even like everyone knows that a soldier that goes to war has post-traumatic stress. And when he comes back, um, sounds will, you know, set that off. And everyone knows that that's a psychological thing and an emotional thing that needs to be worked through. It, that really is how we normalize it for a, a severe trauma survivor because it's the same there is while there are spiritual dynamics that go with it it's really neurobiologically based because researchers were researching on the brain to create whatever they wanted mm-hmm. you know in the in the wider field of let's just be real wide here like religious studies i mean you'll run into things like okay the eastern yogi Okay, that again, they they train themselves, you know, through meditation or whatever technique to, you know, again, using broad terminology to move in and out of altered states, you know, different different states of consciousness. And this has been known for decades, you know, that this can be done. So, you know, on the sort of horrific negative side, you know, you have someone conditioning, you know, a a child, you know, training a, a, a child's uh, both the brain and then the child to sort of recognize this and, uh, you know, for whatever purpose, be in one or not the other. And that that's really what, again, in, in very lay terms, and again, probably committing some imprecision here, but that's essentially what you're talking about. So you're, you're talking about a, a sort of a phenomenon 
that has been recognized for a long time in other areas of research. It just so happens that there's the, there's an overlap with all this awful stuff. Uh, and again, the very manipulative kind of thing, you know, that uh, people have been exposed to just broadly. And, and we should mention here that it doesn't, I mean, you're going to get people that weren't, you know, uh, you, know, you will get people I know because, you know, you've, you've talked to them or talked to me about them, their cases, um, that aren't sort of trained, you know, intentionally, but because they've suffered repetitive trauma in some other way that you get the same sort of thing going on. Yeah, I think that's key to say that uh, dissociation is on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So we have someone who has suffered trauma-based mind control. That's going to be the most severe spectrum. But actually, anyone that has gone through even an episode of sexual trauma or any kind of trauma, what we do even helps them. It really is across the board. I think overall human beings need to understand their own makeup and how they are human. And I think that's an important piece of this as well. Now, um, Audrey mentioned, uh, you know, some of the supernatural aspects. So what, what is the relationship between trauma-based dissociation? And again, what would, what like many listeners I'm sure are thinking of in terms of sort of traditional, you know, demonization, deliverance ministry, because what we're describing to this point isn't that, but there is a relationship. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And a survivor, you know, if we give an example of a survivor that has been as a child brought up to be made to split her mind into, into different um, neurobiological th thoughts and moods, which was what we would call a part so in or, a or an alter in, in other terminology another yeah another part of the person and so in um in a setting where there's a programming session um there's a bunch of kids and someone is going to get traumatized and there's a 17 year old who says okay i'll take the place of that seven year old and so she takes that place and the whole way they're heckling her. You want this? You, you. This is what you you chose. This. You're really, you really are evil. So, this is your life. And so she goes through the trauma, and it's horrendous. And in that powerless place, what she's just been told is she's evil, and she's it's her choice. So she'll reach for a cosmic entity to help her get through that moment. Right. We're, so it, like, instead of crying out to God, it, it can be yeah, well, a different mm -hmm. entity or so, something that she's been taught to reach for. Mm -hmm. Something and, that has yeah. power when she's powerless. And in that, and growing up as a child, God wasn't there for her. So what's more powerful? I'll take that. Yeah. See, and from the 17 year old there has already practiced this many, many, many times. But when you go back to the child who's three, and um, I'm going to get graphic here. So Trey, if you need to edit it out, you just, so the child is on an altar, being raped, going to be raped. And she does not even have the words for this. There's no words for this. And they have her ask for, um, go ahead and ask for Jesus to come. So someone comes out dressed as Jesus, and then he rapes her. Well, that didn't work so well for her. So the next time, they, it's same ritual, same thing. They said, call for you know, Lucifer, who is your father. Well, so she learns, even though it's so abhorrent for her heart, there is so much sensory distortion, and she can't even have a reasoning mind it is survival now that's a different part of her brain she's in survival now and she just wants to live and so she'll go reach through the defilement the yuck of of the darkness power and she'll grasp on to lucifer her father so i think it's important here because when you know, when a lot of Christians sort of read about the occult or Satanism, or something, you're reading about people who willfully, um, you know, want to 
tap into supernatural powers because you know this is going to give me power it's going to give me xyz uh th that same sort of wanting for lack of a better term wanting this attachment again for whatever purpose you know so you're describing a child is going to have that mechanism to reach for that thing not so that you know, they can get like material wealth or prestige or whatever, you know, the, the typical occult Satanist kind of mentality, but they're doing it because they want whatever's being done to them to stop. And so you, you do that repeatedly and it sort of trains them to attach themselves or some part of themselves to that thing. Yeah. Now let's pause there. When they're, when a survivor is reaching for an entity, she or he is choosing life. They don't right. want to die. They're choosing to live and choosing life is Christ. They don't know it at that moment, but that's what their heart is. They want to live. And this is what was powerful, reaching for a cosmic intelligent evil because they've been told they're evil their whole life. And so why not? But it really is out of a place of love for them, their own heart to choose to live. And now look what look what you just brought up, Mike. That's that's what we're talking about. See, while that ritual sounds horrible, and it is horrible, it's at most of us recoil inside when we hear this level of trauma all the time. And this is what a, a survivor has lived through. But if the perpetrators were after the attachment tear to put in the belief that the child is not redeemable, because if you can get that set into a three-year-old, by the time they're eight and you need to start building assassins, they already believe they're evil. So to start killing other little kids or whatever along the way, they, they're going to be taunted that they've already attached to Lucifer, to the dark side, to this. So it wasn't about that they wanted to, they brought a Luciferian ritual in or a, a Satanist ritual in to practice Satanism. It was for the goal to tear attachment and distort the identity of the child so they have no understanding of imaging God. None. Yeah, and for our, our listeners, you've already heard some references again to, you know, supernatural beings, imaging God. Again, we're, we're going to get at some some point, you know, in our discussion today, you know, hey, how does, you know, how does what my content, you know, what, what does that do to help, you know, how did... How did you all sort of run into each other and, you know, connect and it actually, you know, amounted to something? Uh, you're, you're getting a little bit of, of, of a glimpse of that at this point. It's really kind of interesting to me um, that, um, again, going back to pop culture, uh, other than the two things that, that I mentioned, you know, the movie Split and then Stranger Things, and, and Stranger Things especially, um, it it's well done in, in a lot of aspects, but they actually took a lot of, you know, they, they don't have a lot of, uh, the one character, Eleven, she's a, she's a survivor and, you know, she has these, these powers and whatnot, but they, they actually took some of what was done to her when you were, when you're watching the show, they have to have her have flashbacks so that you know, like what in the world's going on with this, this kid. And they took that, you know, from MK ultra research. I mean, they, they took it right out of that. And, you know, like she has to, you know, kill a cat and do things to other, uh, other, I don't want to, you know, you know, they say too much about the show, but she has to do things that she obviously, any normal you know kid, you know, who doesn't have this done to them all the time would be conflicted about. And she's still conflicted. Uh, but, you know, she knows if she doesn't obey and she doesn't do this, what's going to happen to her and all this other stuff. So they took that right out of the research. Uh, it's the same thing like with uh, Captain America Winter Soldier. There it's a little more uh, visceral because you're dealing with an adult probably, you know, the Hollywood gets away with more there. But uh, it's the same kind of thing. You know, th what what you actually see, maybe not the, the way it's portrayed in terms of the outcome, you know, superpowers and all that and sort of the more fantastic elements of science fiction. But there is some of that going on in the real world. And what's done to these people is is sort of just like sucked right off the page of what you would read in a, in an MK ultra study. Um, so that, yeah, that, that stuff actually happens to people and it's perpetrated, you know, against people, children for, you know, re quote unquote research purposes. And what you guys do is essentially deal with the aftermath. 
trying to help people process that and recover. Yeah. Well, I do appreciate the um, analogies to the the movies and the shows that are out there. Um, I do want to say I've never saw those movies and shows. <laughs> and I, I just want to say that for every one of the folks that come to see us, I would say that trauma survivors, those who have survived trauma-based mind control, this purposeful perpetration, for me, they are the most loyal. They are the most um, gifted folks in the body of Christ. They have taught me more about um, how to love. And I've been in the church for almost 40 years. And um, for me, you know, when I think of David's cave of Adullam, you know, all the distressed and the, that, um, but they're the mighty men for me and and those who I minister to, I would have them stand with me anytime in, in that. So I don't, I, I, I know that they've come out of the trauma, but I always, I only see the heart. And I think Audrey's right there with me. I only see the heart of Jesus and how much they've loved and they've taught me a whole lot about that. So I just want to say, sometimes we say, well, what are the folks, you know, like really? Because you only have a backdrop of a, of a movie uh, or something. Right. And I'm like, no, these are the most loving people that I've ever met in my life. Um, and when you always stay connected to the heart of them, even the places, the moments of messy, is really just communication. It really isn't, it's not behavior as far as aberrant behavior, it's communication. And so when you can stay connected to the heart, you understand the communication of some of the behavior. Well, let, let's transition a little bit then. Um, again, referencing, you know, just broadly, the the people that you've come into contact with, that you've worked with, how do, how do they find you? I mean, how do survivors sort of find Fern and Audrey and get started? How does that happen? Well, before the podcast, it was really word of mouth and who, who knew us and, and knew of other survivors and they just gave us our, gave them our name, but we have had, um, referrals from the podcast quite frequently from Trey and you, Mike. And so it's probably at least uh, one or two a week sometimes. Yeah, I can, I mean, I, I, I don't know how many emails Trey gets to refer, uh, but I, that, that, that's not, that's not very far off. I mean, one or two a week. I mean, it's, it's a good number, you know, when you would put our people contacting each of us, you know, separately together. Yeah, we do offer um, a, a free 50-minute um, Skype time with folks that connect with us if they'd like that. And usually uh, Mick Lack has been really gracious in, in covering that for us and meeting that. And we there was over nine hours in just last month that we, we spent time with folks that came through the Fern and Audrey uh, podcast from you and Trey. So is that... Uh, at least right now, is that typically how the process begins for somebody? Typically, yes. We do have, it, it, it's all by word of mouth. The The website is not even presented as what we do. It's really just showing you when you're going to come to see us, this is where you'll be. This is what you'll find. So we're doing no marketing at all. We have no strategy for marketing. When, like after the, procedurally okay someone says yeah i'd like to have a skype call and you have the skype call um and i would imagine that's the point where you have to start talking to the person about making appointments and whatnot and can you just describe that a little bit yeah that's when it comes to the tough part because there is a fee involved with coming to see us and let's just talk about that a little bit since that is one of the questions um, walking into a nonprofit, we we are asking for folks to help us with that, but the fee is one hundred twenty dollars for a fifty minute session. If someone's going to be traveling to come see us, fifty minutes is not a place to start. Typically, we have folks come for three to five days of ministry if they're coming from any significant you know place to fly in to see us. So, if they're doing a four day intensive. They're going to do, um, that's going to be six hours a day. So that's 24 hours of ministry. 
And the overnight stay is minimal. It's $25 a night. And we asked them if they would please just bring their own prayer minister part person, their support person. Um, the ministry is, I don't, we didn't want them just there by themselves. They, we wanted someone else with them. We're looking at attunement, attachment, relationship, and for the journey for them. So you're looking at for a four day intensive, just the ministry. That's not them getting there, renting a car, flying in or whatever. It's a, a little over $3,000. For four yeah, which ministry. yeah, which is why, you know, we started the GoFundMe uh, campaign. Which in you know when when you guys get your tax exempt status, or even now, right. you know, we can start phasing that out. So people who would would be donating to this, and there've been a, a number of people in our audience that uh, have donated through McLot. You know, the uh, the GoFundMe campaign to Fern and Audrey. That's going to you know transition over to your site because you're able to take donations at your site now. Correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it'll be a little, it'll be a little less clunky, yeah. but you know, that it's, it's been helpful. You know, we'd like to, of course, see, see more of that done. We'd like to max out your time, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and do as much of it as, as we can, but mm -hmm. this is what both of you do full time. Mm -hmm. This is not a side hustle. This isn't a little part-time evening job. This is, here's how we get our income or not kind of situation. Correct. Yeah. This, this is our, what we spend our life doing. Yeah. And for a survivor, a four day intensive time, um, they typically will need to come back two or three more times in a year in, for, for them to get their mind back and know their own heart it, after decades of trauma it's it's a journey. It's not a sprint. Right, right. It's not a quick fix by by any stretch of the imagination. Um, one of the things this might relate a little bit to some of what we we've already talked about, but this past week during our discussions, I, I one of the, one of the more helpful sort of phrases or characterizations of what you guys do versus again what might be called a more traditional deliverance ministry or even exorcism, that sort of thing, is that, uh, I, don't, I don't know which of you said it, and it, it might have been one of the other people in the room um, said something like, instead of picking fights, I either, you know, you know, in other words, confrontations with a demon or some supernatural entity, instead of picking fights, uh, you're focused on helping survivors know themselves, know the love of Christ, and just frankly, scriptural truth, you know, speaking truth to them. So that that's a dramatic difference in how you are sort of sitting face to face with a person, what what's actually happening between you. So, the, you know, the picking fights is, you know, kind of the, the Hollywoodish characterization of dealing with this demonized person. And, and that isn't it at all. I mean, that that's no. just not what's going on here. No, no. I, I think I'm just going to go into a, the example of, uh, of a ministry session we had recently. And the the gal has come to see us for about four years now, and she really can process well. So she sits down and she smiles at us and she says, I want to talk about my mom. I hate my mom. I think I want to kill her. And we smile back and we say, so you feel everyone who's involved in that emotion and that thought process, because what she's feeling, the one that's sitting down in front of us is the one that presents, that does life. That's the Christian. She comes to therapy. But there's others inside that she's feeling that wants to kill her mom and is giving communication. There's something here. It's time for you to look at this. So it's not about we're resolving an issue that she's got a conflict with her mom present day. It's a language that she feels it. We talked about where all do you feel that? That when you say those words, I want to kill my mom, I don't like my mom, um, where do you feel that? We're, we're just letting her experience that language, that emotion, so that then she starts feeling and seeing the separateness of each of those pieces. Okay? Mm -hmm. And while we're unpacking that, she has a three hour session. So, what I'm going to tell you in like eight minutes, it's going to three hour session. 
So we start identifying, and she's the one identifying, well, this, I can feel this, this is different. She may even have shifted into a little girl along the way, because that's who held the trauma, the little girl. When the little girl came out and was talking with us, everyone else back here that had all the other emotions were there too. It, this, we were all, they were working together. It's, it's relational. We're talking. It's relational. There's some um, laughter with it because it's just the little girl made a joke and we, it just was just relational. Meanwhile, everyone in, in the room is feeling an edge. Audrey and I and, and, and the gal we're working with. And the gal says, I do feel it. And Audrey said, the cosmic is there. Yes. She goes, yes, I feel it. Wasn't addressed. We evaluated the mindset of what she had about it. Right. So rather than looking at her when she said that saying, you know, come out of her or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're staying because this is the point. Remember, imagine that when this connection was made, the overwhelm of that little girl, there was no reason prefrontal cortex wasn't online the front of the brain wasn't online she was back here so the decision was made back here in limbic to get safe it was a survival moment right now she's feeling the option she understands the mindset that mindset was familiar to her she thought it was hers and the mindset is disdain for humanity just kill steal destroy Mm -hmm. And so we just stayed there and we were tracking with this little girl. Meanwhile, the, the age appropriate, the current age um, gal was there too. And they're, they're all talking to us about, this is what this feels like. I didn't realize that wasn't me. So a new brain pathway is developing that has never developed because they always went in to limbic and connect it to be able to kill. And that's how we, that's how we do. We, we work with someone. We let them feel that and the strong sense of themselves connected in Christ. That's, that's when it's, it's just over. They connect there and they go, I don't want this anymore. I don't need this. Yeah. We stay in love and darkness doesn't want anything to do with love. So they back away with the choice she made to stay in love. And that's why with um, traditional prayer ministry, um, the picking of a fight, fight, like you said, Mike, is it's a power encounter. It's trying to match the power of an intelligent evil. And that's not who we are as humans. Now, just imagine if when, because we all felt it, we all sensed the mindset, we all could recognize, we could all discern it. If I would have shifted and then kind of settled into the warfare stance. And, you know, you, the Lord Jesus had, re had revealed you to us now. We're in authority in the name of Jesus Christ. And I would have moved into that. Right. You, you essentially move onto that turf. You know, you. Into fear. Right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a fear response of a prayer minister. And they, you, that prayer minister just walked into darkness's realm. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. It's, it's having the other. It's having the, the supernatural side pick the fight and you say, okay, let's do that. Yeah, game on, you know, kind of thing. Exactly. So you see, in relationship, in attuning with the fact that there was memory of why she hated her mom. There was real memory and, and it was a right response to say, oh my word, my mom's powerlessness. She's getting hurt right alongside of me and she's the one hurting me. So it's a right response. We help the little girl grieve that. She was powerless. She didn't, she made a decision herself. She didn't want to connect to that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so there was an understanding of all of this convoluted emotional package that she sat with at the beginning of our session. She had understanding to the whole thing and she could settle in all aspects of her that got through that trauma could settle into the identity of I'm God, I belong to God. Would, would it be fair to, to characterize it this way? So instead of 
but let's just take this this other this part again the one that wants to kill um instead of viewing that as a demon to be cast out instead what what you're doing is you're helping uh you know your i don't know how to your patient or you know the person that that's come to you you're helping them instead develop a new pattern of of recognizing that Jesus is superior to that they are actually loved by him. He's not their enemy. In other words, all these these thought patterns. And they want that. They develop a pattern of choosing that instead of the other. Is that what's going on? I would or? say that that is what we're doing, but we demonstrate it. We don't use words. Okay. And we, we go back to words they have given us about their words about their relationship with God. And we say, you see... The love was always there. This so is you. So it's like a process of, of helping them understand and affirming the delegitimization of the thing that seeks to manipulate them or, or, yeah, and, or, or how they were taught and, and what they were grasping for. Kind of kind of a shift of allegiance or a shift of, of understanding. Yeah. And I want to bring back in the point of imaging and how it in trauma-based mind control, they're dehumanized so that they don't recognize that edge is an intelligent evil. They don't, we're helping them understand what it is to be human where they can image out of who they were originally designed to be and not in this um, place of always in a defensive posture be in darkness's realm. Yeah, I think that's really key. This this idea of being dehumanized in trauma based mind control. You could hear just by the few um, stories that we've told and, and other things that you know that they these little children were not allowed just to be human. They had to be superhuman. They had to be able to get the strength of a cosmic to kill. They had to be able to endure. Um, not being able to breathe, or they had to know how to stop their body from having an arterial bleed, or whether they had to know how to psychically manage everything. And even at the very basic place is to not have emotions like humans do. So this dehumanization is really one of the goals. And so I see where we connect strongly with divine counsel stuff is this idea of imaging and just what it is to be human the position of being a human while those words are you know just real small their divine counsel brings a whole concept of of just depth of community family this is why everything is that god did so much more yeah so the the, the divine council metaphor and theology that, that you guys uh, have found the most useful that has the most impact is really the, again, the family stuff, the relational stuff, the imaging stuff, as opposed to this judicial, you know, kind of, okay, we're in the, the council courtroom, whatever, uh, you know, law court. And now we're going to sort of declare a verdict and tell, you know, what's his name to get lost or something like that. The, the, you know that setting and that, that again that metaphor is more confrontational as opposed to this other stuff because because the other stuff really is attachment you know to the right things and the right person uh building the right loyalties thinking the right thoughts about you know about Jesus about God and and so on and so forth and having emotions is okay grieving loss is normal you know, wanting to be with another human being in relationship is um, exactly what God's design is for us. That is foreign to someone who has undergone this level of trauma. Right. And, you know, if that's the case, you can see how someone who, again, in, in sort of a traditional prayer ministry approach, there is an assumption, uh, at least a, a bit of an assumption, maybe a huge assumption on the part of you know, maybe a pastor, a prayer minister, or whatever, that the person they're they're trying to help even is able to comprehend this, or even find it attractive at, at any level, and they just sort of don't. What um, I think we I have a, a series of of things you know again from this past week that I, I wrote down that I wanted to talk about. 
Uh, we, we might have touched on this, but what might surprise people about survivors? I think you, you talked a little bit about that uh, already, that, you know, who they are as, you know, as people, despite, again, some of these other, um, what's the right word, manifestations that, you know, these these bad relationships that they might have built up in their lives. Um, anything else that you sort of took away or heard this week, may, or maybe even going back to the Northport, because that was your... Uh, in terms of sort of being out in the public, um, that was the first time that, you know, we, we tried that. Um, either that or, again, sort of the the meeting, you know, of the last couple of days. Anything else you would want our audience to sort of know about either survivors or what you do, uh, some of the obstacles maybe uh, before we wrap up? I have two things. Um, going on in my mind. First of all, I just want to say that in typical prayer ministry coming out of the church f- for survivors in particular, which is very rare because most modalities don't include dissociation or survivors, um, they they look at this as it's a psychological and a spiritual component. And I think we we have to look and be a thinking people to be able to see the research that has come out in regards to trauma, um, not psychology in regards to trauma and what trauma does to the brain. And we have to realize that trauma affects the organic brain and we have to be aware of how that does that. And so it is going to be a paradigm shift to be able to um, minister to these people in that way. We're not abdicating that, Um, any kind of spiritual involvement. But what happens is if you jump off and just go into the spiritual involvement, like taking them to a a court of appeals or something like that, what you'll end up doing is creating, let me give you an example. When you have a child that's under duress and they're told to get away from that duress by going into a castle and getting safe. Now that child, anytime there's a hint of duress, physically, emotionally, mentally, relationship, rupture, whatever, they'll just go into the castle. Now they're sitting in front of a prayer minister, and now we're taking them into the dimensions to get their parts back. Do you see where we just took them? We didn't take them into a spiritual realm. We took them into their psychological phenomenology in their own head, their own picture of what's going on. And, and that's what's going to happen every time when we immediately jump right into a spiritual dynamic because you see that they had rituals or something done. It's, it's going to harm them. So I, I really want to encourage. There's, there's been a, who, whoever's doing this to them and training their mind in the process has already anticipated that sort I, of thing. I'm wondering if that's the case, Mike. I'm wondering if that's the case. So I just, I just want to, one of the things that you heard me this weekend was I was concerned that people would hear our approach and they would say, well, it's all psychology. It's not, it's not anything, you know, based in, in biblical stuff. It is very much based in biblical stuff and, and, and the foundation that Jesus Christ is the healer. But we're letting that person think and use their mind to get back to the place of who they are designed to be. And that's a thinking reasoning human being that has emotions and um, volition. Now, before we do, um, you know, wrap up, you've had a, a, a pretty considerable response of people uh, from this audience who want to be trained or I, I, I want to learn how to help Fern and Audrey, or I want to learn to do what they do. And you've sort of taken steps to go down that road, you know, to, to develop something. So let, let's talk about that. Yeah, right now, Fern and I are in the process of um, making a curriculum. And the gal that helps transcribe the podcast is coming alongside of us. Kudos to Brenda. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that it's, uh, we're the mouth and she's the pen. So um, that is coming along so that we can have times that people who want to know how to work with people and love them and not harm them can do so. 
and I do want to say we did keep a list. We have the list of 35 of you folks that say, hey, when you get this ready, if we're going to do anything, let us know. We do have that in our database. And if there's others, let us know because we are further in the process than um, last time we did the podcast. And it is, it's first and foremost on our list to get this curriculum finished. Do you have any uh, idea uh, of a timetable? Did, uh, did Brenda give you any idea of a timetable? <laughs> Um, well, there's no timetable. Okay. We are really working hard on this. Yeah, I, I know. I, it, but Bre- Brenda's, for those of you who know her, Brenda's very organized. And so I, I, I was just wondering if she has sort of laid that out for you already. She's probably not going to transcribe this part. Of the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we love you, Brenda. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. So, yeah, thanks again for sharing some of your time uh, with us and, uh, hopefully this is a, a both a, a maybe in, in some respects a a good introduction uh, to what uh, you know you two do. We've had prior episodes, episodes what sixty eight and one forty nine are, are sort of the the key ones. We've had a, you know other ones with um, with Beth, but if you want to sort of zero in on um, Fern and Audrey. Uh, those are the two episodes. I think 149 Beth is in that one as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the the follow up to the earlier one. But th- those are the two key episodes. If you want to learn more, uh, Naked Bible Podcast, episode 68 and episode 149. So, again, for those who haven't listened to them, this is, I think, is a, a sufficient introduction. Uh, if you have listened to those, then you've got a, you know, a good update. Things are progressing here. And one more time, the the new website, discoveringmercy.org. Right. And if you land on that website, you will be able to contribute directly uh, to the Fern and Audrey's ministry. Uh, we will certainly, you know, give an announcement when they, you know, get the final approval of their tax exempt status. Uh, we will leave the, the GoFundMe campaign uh, running because McLot does have tax exempt status currently. So, just a heads up when when they get their own tax exempt status, we'll phase one out and you know direct people to the other. Yeah, I'd absolutely be looking forward to Naked Bible Podcast with some more ideas on how to support these survivors. And also, we would encourage churches if you know somebody or have somebody uh, in your community or congregation, please contact Fern and Audrey on their website, discoveringmercy dot org. And uh, yeah, I, th- uh, don't, I think you, know, you you said in passing this week that there are several churches that are sort of waiting again until you get your exempt status to jump in and help. So yeah, yes. absolutely. Go ahead. They are. Well, that's great. We'll keep a lookout for more. We always enjoy having Fern and Audrey on the show. We appreciate what y'all do and we appreciate everybody out there supporting us and them. And with that, Mike, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.